Hi guys. In this video, I will prove that for any prime number p, the group z over pz star is cyclic. Another way of saying this is that there is some number a such that every non-zero element in z over pz is a power of a. For example, for p equals 5, we can choose a to be equal to 3 because the powers of 3 in z over 5z are 3, 4, 2, and 1. Now the proof I'm going to show you I got from a book called Proofs from the Book which is by Martin Eigner and Gunter Ziegler. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And so I also just wanted to thank you guys so much for 50 subscribers. I really appreciate it. And hopefully one day we can hit 100. That would be really awesome. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you so much and let's get started. Fix some prime number p and let f of n be the number of primitive nth roots of unity there are in z over pz for some whole number n. That is, how many numbers are root of x to the n minus 1, but not of x to the m minus 1 for any smaller whole number m? Well, if f of n is non-zero, Lagrange's theorem implies that n must divide p minus 1, since if x is a primitive root, then x, x squared, x cubed, all the way up to x to the n, will form a subgroup of z over pz star. So now let's assume that there is at least one primitive nth root of unity, and let's call it r. Clearly, any power of r is also an nth root of unity. Because r, r squared, all the way up to r to the n are all distinct, we have found n roots of the equation x to the n minus 1. But a polynomial of degree n can never have more than n roots in any field, so these must be the only roots of x to the n minus 1. But this doesn't necessarily mean that r, r squared, r cubed, all the way up to r to the n are all primitive. Indeed, choose some k that shares a common factor with n. Since r to the power of n is equal to 1, r to the power of a multiple of n is also 1. But n times k over gcd of k and n is a multiple of n. So therefore, r to the power of n times k over gcd of k and n must be equal to 1. So, r to the power of k to the power of n over gcd of k and n is equal to r to the power of k times n over gcd of k and n equals 1. And therefore, we know that r to the k is actually not a primitive nth root of unity because it is also a n over gcd of k and nth root of unity. We have now shown that r to the k can only be a primitive nth root of unity if k and n are coprime. So out of our list r, r squared, r cubed, dot 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 r to the n of nth roots of unity, only terms with powers coprime to n could possibly be primitive. So we have shown that there are most phi of n primitive nth roots of unity, where phi of x is defined as the number of whole numbers between 1 and n that are coprime to n. That is, we have shown that f of n is less than or equal to phi of n for all n. Now choose any non-zero h in z over pz. Consider the sequence h, h squared, h cubed, etc. Eventually, there must be some term equal to 1. Let h to the j be the smallest such term. So h is a primitive jth root of unity, and therefore it contributes to f of j. In fact, every non-zero number in z over pz contributes to f of s for some s, and so therefore f of 1 plus f of 2 all the way up to f of p minus 1 must be greater than or equal to p minus 1. We know that f of n is equal to 0 if n does not divide p minus 1 by Lagrange's theorem from earlier. If n does divide p minus 1, we showed that we have f of n is less than or equal to phi of n. So therefore, the sum over divisors of p minus 1 of phi of n is greater than or equal to f of 1 plus f of 2 plus f of 3 all the way up to f of p minus 1, which in turn is greater than or equal to p minus 1. Now, assume for contradiction that there is some n dividing p minus 1 such that f of n is strictly smaller than phi of n. Then, the sum over divisors of p minus 1 of phi of n is strictly greater than f of 1 plus f of 2 dot 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 all the way up to f of p minus 1, which is greater than or equal to p minus 1. Now here, in my opinion, is the coolest part of the proof. Consider the set of fractions 1 over p minus 1, 2 over p minus 1, all the way up to p minus 1 over p minus 1. Clearly, there are p minus 1 of them. Now write them each in lowest terms and count how many times each denominator will appear. Clearly, only denominators that divide p minus 1 can appear. 
Of these, each denominator n will appear exactly phi of n times because if the numerator is not coprime to n, it could be further simplified and n would not be the final denominator. If it is coprime, the fraction cannot be further simplified. This means that the total number of fractions to appear is equal to the sum over divisors of p minus 1 of phi of n. But we already know that there are exactly p minus 1 fractions. So the sum over divisors of p minus 1 of phi of n is equal to p minus 1. But this contradicts that the sum over divisors of p minus 1 of phi of n is greater than p minus 1, which we found earlier. So therefore, we have reached a contradiction. Therefore, our assumption that f of n is less than phi of n for some n that divides p minus 1 must be false. We already have that f of n is less than or equal to phi of n, so therefore, f of n and phi of n must be equal. In particular, for n equal to p minus 1, there are phi of p minus 1 primitive p minus 1 roots of unity. Let c be one of these. Then c, c squared, c cubed, all the way up to c to the power of p minus 1 are distinct, and hence, c generates z over pz, star. So therefore, z over pz star is cyclic, and we are done. I hope that you enjoyed this video and found it interesting. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.